Welcome everyone to the 2021 South Dakota Local Foods Conference. Carrie, are you ready to get us started? Yes, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our, I think, 11th annual South Dakota Local Foods Conference. Our committee has been working hard to put this conference together. Uh, we truly wish we were in Sturgis with all of you. That's where we were going to be. Um, but this pandemic has thrown a wrench into a lot of things. And we decided to do an online conference again this year. If you were with us last year, we felt our conference went fairly well. And I think we've made some improvements this year. And we are able to offer you some really high quality speakers as well as I hope many of you got a new welcome box in the mail within the last several days. So we've been able to do a few things um, because of some great sponsors that we have. And I would like to thank them and then I'll get a little bit um, more into our committee. Our sponsors tonight, if you were joining us and were able to see the rolling video include the NRCS Natural Resources Conservation Service, Monument Health in Western South Dakota, the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition, North Central SARE and our local South Dakota SARE project, and Zantera, which is the uh, food company that works at Mount Rushmore. So we wanna thank all of them for contributing funding to our program tonight, as well as the farms that contributed to your food boxes and um, welcome boxes that you received in the mail. They include Cycle Farm, Prairie Coteau Farm, Little Shire Farm, Prairie Moon Herbs, High, Mower, High Mowing Organic Seeds, and USDA Rural Development. They all put um, things in the boxes in addition to some of our sponsors that also included things. So um, hopefully you enjoy those boxes and are able to use the food products. I uh, do wanna thank our committee and our committee works hard all through the year. Um, I'm Carrie O'Neill and I've been on that committee almost every year, I think that the food conference has been happening. I work for SDSU Extension, my area's community vitality and several of us in extension contribute to the committee and to the conference. In addition, we have the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association, who has again, always been a part of this, this conference and took the lead on putting the conference together this year. Dakota Rural Action has always been a part of the conference as well. And we thank them for contributing. Um, the Waukini Initiative through their Wheezy Pan Project has been a contributor the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and Bear Butte Gardens through Michelle. All of us have met together several times to get this conference put together. So if you have questions or concerns, you can reach out to any of us. And then we wanna thank SDSU Marketing and Technology Team for the support, technical support throughout this conference over the next couple of days. So again, welcome to all of you. We're so glad you could join us. And I am thrilled to be able to introduce our first speaker, our keynote speaker for this evening. Rob Haig joins us from Inwood, Iowa. Rob has a company called Blind Butcher Brewing Company. Try saying Blind Butcher Brewery <laughs> three times. <laughs> um, I was able to visit with Rob by phone earlier and I think he's a, an amazing person with an amazing story. He and his family work on 30 acres in Lyon County, Iowa. And they're really close to the South Dakota border. So I wanted us to welcome him into our network. Um, he's closer to most of us than he is to many of his Iowa counterparts. But his story goes from um, vision challenges to developing a business that can address a, an institute that works on those challenges. And I won't say any more, but I do want to introduce Rob and thank him so much for being with us tonight. You can all give him a hand. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie, uh, for uh, inviting us to uh, speak or me to speak on behalf of our family here at Blind Butcher Brewery. Um, just to get things started, I think uh, I think you nailed it there with the name. It is a it's a it's a mouthful, and, and the question always is where did that come from? And so I'll start with uh, maybe the beginning of that story uh, began. Uh, around March of last year, just as COVID came into the area and started to shut things down, um, my family uh, began to think a little bit more about sustainability. Um, we have 30 acres that we've never used. It's all pasture ground, but we've never used it as pasture. And 
Um, and so we decided to get into livestock and we did that really quite blindly because I, I've never raised livestock before, but my brother had uh, three bred cows. And so uh, we bought those from him and um, we're getting them into our farm and uh, we're setting up a water fountain and the, the uh, plumber said, say, uh, what, uh, what are you going to do with your livestock when it comes to processing? And we thought, well, of course, we'll take it over to our local locker here in Canton or Hills or Hudson. And uh, the plumber said, no, I don't know if you've heard yet, but they're full. And um, so that was uh, quite a surprise to learn once we get into the livestock business for beef that we had nowhere to go. And so, um, we began to think about the next step in sustainability where um, we, we felt that we needed to learn how to do this again. We know that our, our grandparents and great grandparents all knew how to process livestock on the farm. And so we did the same thing and we went to the internet. And ironically, one of the first places that we uh, landed on for a website to teach us was the SDSU extension website. And I think um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with all of the, the flooding of the market with uh, pork and, and the lockers filling up, I think the extension offices knew that farmers were going to begin learning how to process on their own. And they wanted to make sure they gave them the resources to do this safely as possible. And so we followed that um, some of those guidelines from, from those online sources. And then um, we also uh, took special note of there's a couple of brothers um, over in Ohio that have a, uh, a locker and they've created a YouTube channel called the Bearded Butchers. And uh, maybe some of you have heard of them or seen their videos, but they in great detail show you the process of uh, um, processing beef and pork. And so we basically learned how to do uh, everything that we, we learned at that time. And with them, um, with the name Bearded Butchers, then my kids uh, started, well, it, the, the name came up, The Blind Butcher. And um, that's part of my story as well. And I'll kind of get into that more later. Uh, moving on throughout, through the year with the livestock, uh, it, um, we were surprised uh, with a, a small windfall of money that we didn't expect. It was a a 20 year old cancer policy that I had invested in that if you have 20 years without any claims, they refunded all of my premiums for 20 years. So um, we had a lump sum of money that uh, came at the perfect time. And so that gave us the, uh, the funding to invest in uh, processing equipment, meat saw, band saws, things like this. And um, what do we do? That was half of the money. So what do we do with the other half? And we decided to get uh, into uh, brewing beer. And we did that with a, a hobby system, but it was a higher end um, stainless steel system that really allowed us to um, explore that, that whole thing. And um, my, my son had done this in our, in our home before, and it seemed like there was a, always a a huge chance for failure. And so with this equipment, then um, we learned how to uh, do it like the pros, but um, with more success than the hobby, hobbyists, I guess. And so there's, uh, there's the, the butcher and the brewing and then, and then the blind part. So um, in 2009, I was diagnosed with a uh, degenerative retin retinal disease called retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, that's also known as, for short, just RP. And so when I was uh, diagnosed with that in, in 2009 um, in a Sioux Falls uh, ophthalmology clinic, they, um, it's quite rare. And so they sent me to the University of Iowa where they knew Dr. Stone and his team there were specialists in, in this disease. <clears throat> and they knew everything uh, that was known um, they were they were top of the class in, in the world for what they do and so i went there and uh, learned that this this 
degeneration of my vision was very slow, uh, slow process. And so from 2009 until 2017, um, life was pretty much normal. But by 2017, um, I had trouble seeing uh, at night and uh, driving. And so I would always get my driver's license renewed down at uh, the University of Iowa. And um, when I went down there in 2017, Dr. Stone uh, let me know that was probably the last time that he could renew my driver's license. And so for the last four years, I've been um, spent a lot of time in this shed, which is now a brewery. And um, how that all came to be was um, really uh, quite a shock to us. A year ago, none of this was even a thought. And uh, so last year we were, we were processing, we were brewing, and then we thought, you know, we have this shed down at the end of the driveway, maybe we should convert it into a brewery. We had the facility. And we did a little checking last year in October uh, into November, and we just decided that it was not worth uh, the challenge. The licensing and the applications were um, overwhelming and it just wasn't worth it anymore. And so we were just gonna continue on with um, our livestock and brewing and um, just for ourselves. Um, then I went to the eye doctor uh, right around Thanksgiving last year and to upgrade my prescription for my glasses. and. This is something I, I do often because um, with, my, with my diagnosis, I, what I can see, I see very well. It's the, the problem is with my field of vision. It's not the quality of my vision. So when, when, uh, when I would start to get blurry vision, it was usually just time for upgrading my glasses. And so went into the optometrist in Sioux Falls last year and the optometrist said, um, I'm sorry, but your lens is not changing. It's your disease that's progressing to cause some blurry, blurred vision. And uh, having uh, heard that, then I um, got a little nervous again. I hadn't talked to Dr. Stone or the University of Iowa for four years because um, really there was um, little point in, in continuing to go down there when I knew it was only going to continue to deteriorate. And so uh, a little bit like a Hail Mary pass, I contacted Dr. Stone's office and I asked them if they had come any further with um, their research and perhaps a treatment or um, something that, that they could offer. I had heard there were some things in the works uh, at, at other laboratories in the US but the uh, problem that I ran into right away is I, when I heard that the price tag was going to be something around a million dollars to um, to repair my vision, if they could even do it. And so I contacted uh, the University of Iowa, and um, and they they said uh, it was it was my timing was uh, what we say serendipitous now because. Two days later, my doctor was doing a, an online seminar and I was able to get a ticket into that, um, that seminar to hear him speak. And within the next hour, he was explaining how a few years ago, they had figured out a treatment and a cure for RP and other forms of blindness. And um, that uh, just, uh, I mean, Great news, obviously, um, but how how will they do this? And he went on during this um, seminar to explain really the whole process and uh, um, what they will do uh, in a nutshell uh, explanation is they will take a, a sample of my skin and um, put it in a dish and grow a new photoreceptor cells from my own skin. And they will in incubate that in a dish and uh, for four months, about four months. And then um, they put it on this very tiny mesh that is small enough to roll up like a taco and put it into the barrel of a needle and put that back 
into my eye where my body then will take over and continue to grow this new, um, it's not really a new retina, but a new um, photo cell, uh, photoreceptor uh, platform. And um, this all sounds like uh, science fiction, but it's actually science fact. Um, this is actually happening. Um, so uh, the, next, the next scene came when, after learning about all of this, um, the, the invitation that I got to the meeting, uh, to the seminar to hear Dr. Stone speak came from the director of the foundation of the, um, it's the University of Iowa Institute for Vision Research. And it's IVR uh, for short. And when the foundation director contacted me and, and wanted to speak, I suspected that um, she was doing her job of raising money. And I um, told her that um, I have way more time than money, but perhaps we could brew some beer and use it as a vehicle to raise money for the IVR. And um, she was intrigued by by that idea and one thing led to another and pretty soon um, we were both on board with this mission to raise money and awareness to help fund the IVR uh, down at the University of Iowa. And um, we've now been open for, uh, this is our seventh weekend that we've been open and we've raised um, several thousand dollars and but better than anything, um, which we can't put a price on, is the uh, number of people that have walked through our door who have RP or they have relatives who have RP and um, they just stumbled upon a story on us in a local newspaper or heard it from a friend. And so to be able to share this story um, with them of what, what I know is happening down, down there at Iowa City um, that's really the best part about my, my new job here at, uh, at our farm, um, is just being able to share that. And, um, I think perhaps that you have, maybe some of you have a lot more questions than, than what I can maybe ramble on here about the whole process. But, uh, um, I think that's, um, pretty much the, uh, the whole story of how, how this all came to be. And um, I'm gonna ask Carrie if, uh, if you're ready to help lead me through some questions, I'd love to get started on that. Sure. Does anybody wanna, is anybody brave enough to turn on their mic and ask a question or would you like to put it in the chat, in the uh, Q&A box? Either way, I'll find it. And, and while they're thinking, Rob, I, yeah. I'm curious about you said the paperwork seemed daunting for getting your brewery going. What happened to change your mind? Um, it was it was really going from this isn't worth it to this is really worth it. Um, it's getting to be to be able to get behind a cause that um, like this that obviously I have a self interest in, but but also um, something I didn't mention earlier that is really really shocked me was the the decision for the IVR to um, do this entirely as a nonprofit operation. And um, I think uh, I think there are so few people relatively speaking with this disease that um, big pharma, if you will, was not interested in investing in this. but Dr. Stone and his, his team, um, all have the commitment to see this through and to make it affordable. Um, like I mentioned earlier, if it was going to cost a million dollars, then you know there's no chance that my insurance would ever cover such a thing. And I think Dr. Stone and his team had the same conversation that if we're developing something that no one can afford, then what good is it? So their biggest, one of their biggest hurdles was to um, not only accomplish this incredible technological uh, breakthrough, but to deliver that affordably. And so um, they're predicting that they can 
treat people for between 20 and $50,000 instead of a million. And um, they're so, so after we, we opened the brewery, we had a, a ribbon cutting with the Iowa, um, the folks from IVR. And then they invited us to go down there and see the lab for ourselves and what was happening. So we had a, a backstage pass to a place where they're innovating um, equipment like I can't believe. They are creating uh, incubators to do 500 patients at a time instead of one. And it's all done with robotics that they had to in invent. Um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention or innovation and they certainly are doing it there. So there's the long answer to your question. <laughs> oh, that's amazing, thanks. It was so interesting to me. We do have a question from one of our viewers and she would like to know, are you growing your own hops for the beer? We, uh, we were really fast tracking into this and um, we have a neighbor next door who grows hops and another one just a few miles away. So we had two local sources for hops. And um, unfortunately, they uh, both surprised me that they were not going to continue in business. They had a couple of really tough years weather-wise. It was too, I believe it was too wet and cool for hop production. And then um, the market prices were really tough to compete with the growers, the big growers out in Washington state, kind of, uh, I think, dominate the hop industry right now. So as much as we'd love to um, local source that or grow our own, um, right now we really have our hands full with, with just what we're doing here right now. But it's a great question. And I can just say, I know growing hops is a ton of work. Um, I think it's a lot like um, growing grapes and tending to grapes. So if there are any hops growers in our audience, you might send a little message to Rob. <laughs> um, yeah. We have some more questions too in the Q&A box. Um, one is when it comes to regulations and licensing, where do you start? Who do you reach out to? And who helped you along the way? Great questions. Um, we really didn't know where to start. And so um, we went to the, the people who were already doing it and had some connections with some craft brewers in Sioux Falls and uh, just called them up and, and told them that we were making the jump from hobby brewing into commercial brewing and um, what advice could you give us? And um, I think when it comes to licensing with a, our, our licensing began at the local level uh, in, our, in our county supervisors, because we're not in a city. And then um, your next step is the federal level, uh, the TTB. And so we had to apply for a federal brewing permit. And then, um, and then the next was with our state at Iowa ABD. And when I contacted Iowa, they told me that the federal process was going to take six months. And um, it turned out it only took three, three weeks. So fortunately, we, didn't, we weren't discouraged enough to just drop everything. Um, as soon as we got out of the county meeting in February, we started digging here in April. And um, we actually sold our first craft beer in August. And so it was a very uh, fast track um, time. And, I would say also the equipment that we bought in advance of these supply shortages really saved us because um, just I heard today that stainless steel is very hard to come by. And so the price for uh, brewing equipment and kegs, everything stainless steel is becoming difficult. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Christine Lang, who I know she said visited your brewery not too long ago. I remember. <laughs> she, would, she would like to know, do you see potential for other enterprises to complement your meat and brewery businesses on your 30 acres? And what would that look like for you and your family members? She says she recalls seeing a high tunnel on the site when she was there. Uh, yeah, so your intro 
videos were very uh, intriguing um, because when my son, um, he went to Iowa State and he majored in agronomy. And so he came home and we, um, and he and his uh, future bride began a, um, a CSA um, out of a high tunnel and did that for a couple of years. And um, the, uh, I, I guess what happened is um, life came along and married and children and it just put a damper on the CSA project. But um, certainly I think with the traffic that we have now for the brewery, I also wish we had the produce that we used to grow here a couple of years ago and really utilize the land, not just for livestock, but you know, to continue our gardens. Um, unfortunately, this, this summer we had some terrible storms that came through and it lifted our CSA poop building out of the ground and set it back down in the wrong spot. So it'll be a while before we get that running again. Thank you. Um, and along with your talking a little bit about your cattle and livestock growing business, is there's a question about the butchery component and is that for sale or are you doing that primarily for family use right now? It's, it's, <laughs> it is definitely just for family. Um, the, the investigation we did into commercial processing was very short because um, those rules uh, and regulations are very highly regulated. Um, I think, uh, you know, we feel safe in, in, in processing meat for our own families, but going beyond that, we, um, we would never attempt that. Um, but I know a number of new lockers that have opened up in our area here as a result of the shortages. And I think there are groups of farmers coming together to create their own plants for processing. So I think there's a huge opportunity in that. And, you know, for us, it's just a sustainability um, here that we are learning these old skills and um, using them and making uh, really some of the best bacon that we've ever tasted. So we enjoy it, but commercially, I, there's no future for us in, in the butchering process. It's been exciting to see those small um, locker plants start up here too, as well. Um, there's a question about your about grains. Where do you source your barley and other grains for your beer? Yes. Um, so the uh, the closest um, retailer that we have found is in Shakopee, Minnesota, and so I believe a lot of the small grains are grown around there. Um, I got a letter from them today. Um, telling us that um, the barley crop this year was a lot was much less productive than in years past and so the price of barley for us was going up significantly so um, in their response to the the question of where do you source locally when you have problems like this is there relying on a much larger network than they had in the past and so I can see the the benefit of that as well um, to just be able to have sources other than just our local in, in case we have um, these weather issues that create uh, supply shortages. So that rolls right into the next question. <laughs> Bill would like to know what are the chief problems you've encountered in having a profitable product and have you had to or do you plan to receive the, this operation on your eyes, two separate questions. Yeah, um, so the, the, eye, the eye one first, um, they, uh, Dr. Sohn always says, I, I would rather um, under promise and over deliver. So he tells me to uh, not look for a treatment for probably five years, but less than 10. And um, if they can offer that sooner, uh, that'll be the better. Um, I think one of the uh, related question was, will, um, will, we, will I get both eyes done? And um, actually, so they can treat the most people as possible, they're gonna just do one, your worst vision, your worst eye first, and then 
go from there. Um, the other question I've, I've, I've already forgotten how to. I should have asked you one at a time. <laughs> what are the chief problems you've encountered in having a profitable product? Um, we, we haven't had any problems with the, the profitability. The, um, I, I think like other food production, um, the, the profitability is there. It's, it's getting the traffic um, really to support that, the, the demand side of it. Um, we kind of knew our market that we were getting into. Um, there are other craft brewers popping up near us, but um, you know, it's a big market and we're doing one of the best pieces of advice we receive from other craft brewers is to not go too big, start as small as we can and don't overproduce um, what we can market ourselves. And so that was great advice because it kept our equipment um, costs at a minimum, we have a one barrel system. Um, and that is the, it's technically a nano brewery um, size uh, system. And uh, I think most breweries, when you, when you think of them, you picture three and a half barrels or, um, or larger. And um, so when people come into our shop, we have, we have the tap room on this side of the building and the brew, brewery on the other side and our, our, fermenters are quite small and people say, where do you brew? And, oh, it's right over there. It's, but they're, they're, um, they're not nearly, nearly as big as what you normally imagine, but that's all part of the profitability is not overspending on equipment and, um, you know, growing into our market. Um, we, we do really well selling other craft brews on the wall as well. Um, we have 15, uh, of, of the best selling craft beer across Iowa as, as our um, complement to our own beers, which will just start begin to come online um, within the next couple of weeks. Um, we should have our first, first batches coming out. All right, Anna is asking a question that I'm curious about too. She read an article about your family and saw that your children have talents that they're contributing to your operation. So she'd like to know more about your family members and sure. how they're active in this project and the roles that they play. Yeah. Um, so my oldest daughter, she is uh, she she works for the Department of um, Veteran Affairs, and she is quite the event planner. Um, she she sees uh, big events like that really well, um, and she uh she's 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 going to be contributing a lot more of that in the future her her talents um most of the others are in um business or marketing or architecture we have a landscape architect we have a um uh structural engineer mechanical architect and um and yeah marketing we have an interior um architect does hospitals and clinics and things like this so we had a, everybody was able to chip into the whole project and we we really made this a family uh, business where everybody could contribute their talents so yeah we were very well suited for all of that sounds like a great story uh christine is also curious about the brewery patrons if you were to estimate the split between local visitors versus folks traveling from further away, what does that look like? And what has the community reception or support of the brewery been like? Um, it's been really good. Um, as far as the, the, the demographics, uh, it's definitely an older crowd of people. I think um, we get a lot of def uh, demographic information from our social media websites and the highest age group of people who follow us online are 35 to 44 year old women um, by a 66% margin over men. Um, so that's interesting. We have people who in the first seven weeks that we've been open have come from California, New York. Um, they're just passing through. Um, we've had, we have, a lot of people from Sioux Falls who like to venture out into the country, um, try something new, um, and our local support as well. Um, 
our neighbors say that this place is dangerous because it's too close. And uh, of course they're joking, but, but we do enjoy seeing people regularly. Um, I, it seems like every weekend we have about 50% uh, new people who then come the following week, week and they bring more friends. And so it's been slowly growing uh, ever since we started and we may have to think about adding on someday. I think I've heard that you have a partnership with a dairy up the road too. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so we, as we began to, to do all this, we, we realized um, that we had to feed people as well. Um, they couldn't just come here from three to 10 PM and not have food. And so we started looking for a, um, a wholesale pizza manufacturer or distributor. And we were having a hard time. And just as our need uh, developed, then Stunsland Dairy um, are, is just a few miles north of here. And we've known their family since we were born. And uh, they started producing on top of their delicious ice cream, um, doing delicious pizzas uh, in addition to that. So I think maybe we were one of the first retailers of their pizzas. And it's just, you just can't beat their cheese and ice cream. Sienna would like to know if there's some other successful collaborations you've had with local producers or local businesses. Um, I think uh, I think there will be a lot more collaborations with other craft brewers as we move along. Um, we this is, I guess, part of our story I should have mentioned is that what, what we are doing here is, is laying the foundation for a, a much larger effort to brand, to use our brand and product to hit a much larger market. Um, and the university has been super helpful with that. And um, just for, for example, we know that craft brewers out there have done um, fundraisers, fundraiser recipes for production for different causes. And one in particular was the uh, California Rainforest Restoration Project that a brewer took on. And I think within a month through their efforts, they raised $8 million in one month. And so we we think, well, if that's been done for trees, we can do this for people and vision. And we don't know how we're going to get from A to B yet, but we're on that path. And I think we, you know, talking about collaborations, there are people we have yet to meet who will cross our path and say, I can help you get from A to B and do this. And so we look forward to that and every day is a new adventure here. So you just never know who's gonna be on that phone call tomorrow <laughs> that wants to help. Everybody wants to help. Sounds like you've had awesome response. Um, we have another question. Have you thought about adding entertainment? Yes, um, although our, our, our people, our crowd, they, they really like our softer approach to the entertainment side of things in that it's a quiet place to where you can come with friends and visit and not be drowned out by music that's too loud or distractions. Um, so we're pretty conscious of not only what you see and smell and taste, but what you hear. And I think um, if we add entertainment in the future, it's gonna involve some outdoor uh, events that um, we can set that up for in the in the next year um, but yeah we could handle something really small in here but on the same hand we we've, we've learned that our from our customers that they they just like it in the background they don't want that to be in the foreground um, I can't tell you how many people they walk in the door and they're kind of blown away at the scale of this giant machine shed now turned into a brewery and then all of a sudden across the room they see a classmate they haven't seen for 20 years and then it's um 
you know, we just see that over and over people reconnecting socially after, you know, the last couple of years we've had, I think people are hungry for that. And, um, and another quick story, we had a, we had our, um, a mistake on our social media. So a couple from Sioux city was sitting outside, uh, on our parking area and another one from Pocahontas, Iowa, they're quite distant and we were late, uh, to open, but they became friends in that short amount of time and then spent the entire afternoon <laughs> sitting at the same table and getting to know each other. And so it's just really cool to see that happening here and being part of that. That is neat. Um, Chris has a question about your operation hours and days. I think you've mentioned a little bit. But... Yeah, um, so we're open on Fridays and Saturdays from four to 1030. And then we're also open um, for events as they come about. And so we just booked our second family reunion here for a Sunday afternoon. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we have the space available to do that. Um, I think there's a great opportunity there for smaller venues like ours. We, we can handle um, up to 99 people indoors. And I think a lot of the other venues um, out there are three to 400 people and maybe just there, I think there's a niche for um, that, that size, uh, you know, between 50 and 50 people that we're filling. So I've been admiring the mural behind you. Can oh. you tell us the story of that? Yeah, it was just, um, it, it began with a sign over my shoulder. Um, my old neighbor back when I lived in Inwood in the town, um, he, he's known as Sign Man because he hand painted, painted signs. He is very old school. And he designed that sign for us. And then the rest of the wall was basically built around that sign. And so we created this old, uh, old style building facade. And then the, he also did the mural. He, he does, um, cityscapes usually on streets. Um, and so he came in and did that mural later. Um, and that's what our Western view looks like in the summertime. So we're thinking as these winter months come along that, uh, we can have, uh, we can think about warmer days or to come when we're sitting inside here. Right. Who needs to go south? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so any other questions? I'm not seeing any typed in, but if you have one, please type it in. We have some time. Rob, do you have any other good stories? I love the story about the two people that met in the parking lot. Any other things that have happened that have been humorous or um, might help somebody else with a challenge? <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I just thought of the the challenge uh, uh, the challenge story of people who who have this disease and think there is no hope, and um, a, a woman walked in here being led by her brother, who drove her who, who drove here from Texas to bring her here to learn more about this treatment. And when she walked in the door, she heard my voice and she said, are you Mr. Hope? And I said, no, I'm a hag, H-A, and she said, no, 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 Mr. Hope, like in this article I read. And so that, that's about the third time that has happened here um, in the last seven weeks. And so, like I said earlier, it is the the part of all of this that is more important than raising the money is raising the awareness because she walked out of here with hope. She had, has had this disease for 20 years and has never been told that there was a treatment even being researched, let alone um, just some paperwork away from happening. So we love those stories and we, we hope there's more and we hope that if whoever is watching this, if you ever run into people who have any kind of retinal blindness that they check in um, with either us or the University of Iowa Institute for Vision Research, because they will, their, um, their motto on their wall is leave no one behind. 
And they're very serious about that effort to not leave anybody behind because you can't afford this or you think, you know, there is no help. Um, that, that's, that's why we're here. That's why all this paperwork and all these hours is worth it, so. Rob, I feel like that's just a perfect place to stop your conversation. There aren't any more questions, except that a uh, question about will this recording be available? And um, yes, we can we can figure that out. We'll talk about that later in the conference as well. But um, I just want to thank you so much for being here. Um, there's a comment in the chat that says you are certainly an inspiration to others, and your positive attitude is amazing. Thank you for sharing your story. And I totally agree with that. Your story is, is an amazing one and how, how everybody has just been coming together and helping and seems like things just happen at the right time. So your faith must be tremendous. And, and I think Mr. Hope is such a great, a great name. Yeah, I, well, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, no, I, I, people often get our name wrong. And so I was just like, no, it's, it's spelled like this. And yeah, it just, uh, it just puts the, the stamp on it um, that we really hope that would happen. And it is happening. And like I said, we're, there are people we haven't met yet that need to be, you know, helped along um, and given some, something to look forward to because I am very confident I'm going to be driving again um, before I retire so that my wife doesn't have to drive me around anymore. So we're looking forward to that day. That's a tough thing to lose, your driver's license. It's huge. <laughs> it really is. You know? All right. Well, you're getting some thanks in the chat. Um, I know you can't read the chat very well tonight, so we've been trying to um, ask the questions that as they pop up, but I don't see any more. So I just really want to thank you for being with us. And I want to just let people know that any of the payment we were going to give to Rob, he is going to pass on to the Vision Institute. So that's a, a neat thing too. And we're, we're thankful for that. People say you're, you're very inspirational and I think everyone loved hearing your story. So thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for um, inviting think, us, yes. I think yeah, I think at this point, um, we'll take a short break before the SARE panel and a reminder that the chat will be saved and just this will be the same link that you come back to. So if you wanna just shut your cameras off for a little bit, we'll come back in 10 minutes and Amanda Bachman will introduce us to the SARE panel. So thank you all for being with us for the first part of the conference. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay.